Monster Itch Ghost Attack by David Labar. Chapter 2. There was a rash on my arm right below my wrist. No, calling the horrible thing I was staring at a rash was like calling the ocean a puddle. This was one monster of a rash. It was as wide as my arm and nearly reached my elbow. It was red and purple and lumpy and it looked like it was about to start dripping things. I didn't want to see dripping out of my body. That's a very long description of something I looked at for less than a second before I let out that shout and raced downstairs. I flung open the screen door and scrambled onto the porch. Grandma was still outside. I slid to a halt when I realized why she was there. She was talking to Mom, who was standing right at the bottom of the porch steps. Mom had come back. She does that a lot. I could see that Dad was waiting for her in the car. This was the worst possible time for Mom to be here. I clasped my hands behind my back to hide my arm. What's wrong? Mom asked. You screamed. If she saw the rash, she'd take me right home. No hikes, no fishing, no ice cream. I saw a spider, I said. A big one, huge, enormous, big enough to eat a bird. As I spoke, I heard Sarah come down the stairs behind me. Mom frowned like she didn't believe me. I should know better than to try to fool her, especially when my brain was still trying to get back down from whichever corner of my school it had fled to when I saw the rash. I think the part about the bird might have been a bit too much. Mom held her hand out. Let me see your arms. Was I that obvious? I guess I was. I unclasped my hands, which had built up a layer of sweat, and held my arms out in front of me palms down. Turn your arms over, mom said. I turned my arms over. Mom stared. I stared. My arms looked perfectly normal. The rash was gone. Alex will be just fine. Stop worrying, grandma said to mom. A minute later, mom and dad finally drove off. What was that all about? Grandma asked after the car reached the end of the driveway and turned onto the main road. I'm allergic to something in that room, I said. We have to switch. Yeah, right, Sarah said. Nice try. I am. Come on, I'll show you. I walked up the stairs. I didn't like the idea of getting another rash, but I figured it was better to do it now so I could change rooms than to have it happen when I went to bed. I walked into the room and waited for the itch. Nothing. I stared at my arms, waiting for the first ant tickle. No ant, not even a flea. Sarah knelt and opened one of the boxes. Cool, she said, lifting out a pair of wind-up chattering teeth. A novelty shop went out of business, Grandma told her. We bought a lot of their inventory. At least I'll have something interesting to look at, I thought. Though boxes of jokes and pranks didn't seem anywhere near as good as a giant TV, Sarah got up. I guess I'll go and pack my stuff in my room. She headed down the hall. Grandma put the box down on a small desk next to the bed. Can I look through this stuff? I asked. Sure, she said. Have a ball. I opened the closest box, which was barely big enough for a small pair of shoes. Yikes! There was a bloody hand in the box. I jumped back and tripped over the box behind me, landing on my butt. Relax, Grandma said. That's not real. I knew that, I said as I climbed back to my feet. Though it sure looked real, it just startled me. A smile spread across my face as a thought hit me. What if I stuck the fake hand under Sarah's sheets? Grandma stared right at me. Don't even think about it, she said. How did you know what I was thinking, I asked. Because you're just like your mother, she said. No way, I shook my head. I couldn't picture my mom playing jokes on anyone. Grandma laughed. Why don't you go run around outside and burn off some of that energy? That sounded like a good idea. I grabbed my ball and glove and went down the hall. Did you bring your glove? I asked Sarah. We both loved sports and we were both left-handed, but that was absolutely all we had in common. You bet, she said. Just give me a minute to finish up. It looked like she was already unpacked. Her bag was empty, but I guess she had more to do. I'll meet you outside, I said.
It took Sarah a while to come down, but I passed the time throwing pop-ups to myself and watching the squirrels chase each other around the front yard. They were dashing across the grass, skittering up trees, and leaping from branch to branch like acrobats. It looked like their grandma had told them to burn off some energy too. Hey, Sarah said when she joined me. If you really were allergic, I'd have swapped rooms with you. I know. Here, she held out a stick of gum. Thanks. I unwrapped the gum, which promised massive berry flavor, and popped it in my mouth. By about the second or third chew, I knew something was wrong. My mouth tasted like fish, and not good fish, not even bad fish. This was definitely terrible fish. Blah! I spat out the gum. Sarah was laughing so hard, she was folded over like she had a stomach virus. What's so funny? I asked. She couldn't even speak. She handed me the pack of gum. Each stick was labeled with berry flavor, but the outside of the package read, Dr. Quack Wacky's Prankster Gum. It tastes like dead fish. Well, that was sure true. You got that gum from a box in my room, didn't you? So that's what she was doing upstairs. Guilty, Sarah said. I'll get you back, I said. I'm sure you will, she said, but her grin hinted that she wasn't worried. After we'd played catch for a while, we sat on the porch steps and watched the squirrels. Then we went back inside. Want to help Grandma and Gramps make dinner? Sarah asked. I need to unpack, I said. What I really needed was to check the boxes for a good joke to pull on Sarah. I went up to my room, but the boxes were gone. So I went downstairs where my grandparents were peeling potatoes and chopping onions. What happened to the boxes? I asked. We took them to the attic, Gramp said. Feel free to look through them up there. They have some wild stuff, great pranks, all sorts of fun stuff. I think I will, I said. I went up the stairs and heard Sarah following behind me before I even reached the second floor. I guess she knew what I was planning. I'd just have to figure out a way to be sneaky. The problem was, I'm not a sneak. As we climbed the attic stairs, my arms started to itch. Oh no, I said. I didn't want another of those monster rashes, but I also didn't want to let Sarah spend time alone with a ton of pranks. Maybe I could put some anti-itch lotion on my arms. It was worth a try. I certainly had just about every type of allergy cream there was, thanks to mom. I went back down to my bedroom and reached in the box to sort through the tubes and bottles, but the itching had stopped. Weird. I headed back up the stairs and my arm started to itch again. I decided to ignore it. Even if the rash came back and even if it was terrible to look at, it seemed to go away just as quickly as it appeared. I wasn't going to let allergies run my life. I climbed all the way up the stairs crossed the landing, and opened the attic door. Ah! Sarah screamed, thrusting a bloody hand in my face. I shouted and jumped back. Very funny, I said after I got control of my heartbeat. Got you, Sarah said as I walked through the door and knelt by the closest box. I love this stuff. I wasn't listening. My arms were itching so badly, I figured I'd have to leave the attic. It was even worse than before, and the rash was on both arms now. I was afraid Sarah would make fun of me, but she was already opening another box. This isn't worth it, I thought. I decided to leave. Look, Sarah said, holding up a large metal can painted bright orange and covered with black lettering. It's Dr. Quack Wacky's patented vanishing powder. It says it makes stains, spots, and spills disappear like magic. That's perfect for you. She pulled open the lid and walked toward me. I'll make you vanish, and I can have the grandparents all to myself. Stop it. I knocked the can from her hands. Powder went flying all over, getting in our hair and eyes and noses. Neither of us vanished. Sarah let out a monster's knee so fierce she bent over. This time, at least, she wasn't laughing at me, and my mouth wasn't filled with the taste of dead fish. I didn't sneeze, instead I let out a gasp. There was someone standing in front of me, in the cloud of powder. But the only way I knew he was there was because he wasn't there. I mean, 
There was a person shaped a dulled size, powder coated, spooky emptiness in the dust reaching toward me. As I stared and rubbed my eyes, the emptiness filled in with a few transparent details, like someone was tinting a sketch with light dabs of watercolors. He was thin and tall, wearing a strange hat that looked like only a brim, a type of visor, I guess, and clothes like the kind you would see in ancient photos from the 1800s. There's only one kind of person who looks like he isn't there. Ghost! I shouted.